to talk about atomic structure and electron configuration. You already know that atoms are comprised of protons, neutrons, and electrons, and that protons have a positive charge and electrons have a negative charge. Like charges repel each other, Opposite charges attract each other. And the attraction and repulsion is the result of an electric force called the Coulombic force. Um, some people will use F with a subscript E. And you see this in the Coulomb's law equation, which is the equation that describes this force. F is the electric force. Um, sometimes in AP chemistry, we call it the Coulombic force. Q1 and Q2 are the charges. R is the distance between the two charges, and sometimes this is shown as D, but usually it's shown as R. And K is a constant. This is the equation how you'll often see it in a physics course. In AP Chem, we're mostly concerned about the relationship between the force and the inverse square of the distance you'll see that we don't have the constant here. We just need to know that the Coulombic force is proportional to the product of the charges. That would be a proton and proton, or proton and electron, or electron and electron. And that's all divided by the square of the distance. And if you spent any time crunching physics equations, um, this does look a little similar to the equation for the force of gravity. It's a different force, but it follows the same inverse square law. Now, let's talk about what an inverse square law is. This means the force is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the two particles. And so if we were to look at a graph of this, and this graph could certainly be a graph for charge, it could be a graph for gravity, you will see that the smaller your distance is between particles, the higher the force is. And this could be an attractive force, it could be a repulsive force, um, but the farther out you go, the weaker that force is. And that means if you have two charges that are very far from each other, they're going to feel less attraction or repulsion, depending on the kind of charges they are than they would if they were much closer to each other. Remember this later because it's going to be important. Now let's look at the atom. The atom is composed of negatively charged electrons and a positively charged nucleus that's made of protons and neutrons. And we use a lot of different models to represent atoms. Which one we use at any given time depends on what phenomenon we're trying to explain. So all of these have different purposes. They don't really look like what the atom looks like, but that's really not the point. Now, the model we're going to look at today is called the shell model, and it's a way to help describe the arrangements of the electrons in the atom. In this model, electrons orbit the nucleus in circular orbits. These orbits are discrete levels. The electrons in them have fixed energies, and each orbit is a fixed distance from the nucleus. So the orbit depends on the energy of the electron. The inner electrons are called core electrons. There they are. And they occupy the lowest energy levels. The outer electrons are called valence electrons, and they occupy the highest energy levels. Elements can have up to eight valence electrons. The shell model of the atom is just one way of looking at the atom, and there are many phenomena that it's pretty good at explaining, but there are a lot of things it can't explain. At the subatomic level, things get really weird, and the shell model just doesn't hold up. The quantum mechanical model of the atom is the model that was proposed to account for some of this weird stuff. 
It was based on the work of people like Albert Einstein and Max Planck and Louis de Broglie. These scientists were working on the idea that sometimes light behaves as a wave and sometimes it behaves as a particle. They were also exploring the idea that sometimes matter behaves as a particle and sometimes it behaves as a wave. And this wave nature of matter is really obvious when you're looking at very, very tiny bits of matter like atoms. Werner Heisenberg proposed that it's impossible to know where an electron is and how fast it's moving at the same time. The more you know about one, the less you know about the other, and we can only know where an electron probably is, and his idea is called the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. Edwin Schrodinger derived a very complicated equation, which helped us understand where any given electron is most likely to be, and we call these probability densities. There are also places where an electron is not likely to be. When we talk about the quantum mechanical model, we talk about probability densities instead of orbits, because we never know for certain where a given electron is. We can only know where it is probably going to be about 90% of the time. We call these probability densities orbitals. Not orbits, but orbitals. As in the Bohr model or Shell model, these orbitals have different energies, but electrons aren't actually orbiting around the nucleus. It's a bit more complicated than that. And this is where quantum physics comes in, which fortunately we're not covering in this class. Now here's a picture of some probability distributions. The areas with color show where electrons are more likely to be, and the areas without color are called nodes, those are regions where an electron has zero probability of being found. The quantum mechanical model has energy levels just like the shells in the shell model. It also has subshells named S, P, D, and F. And each of these contains one or more strangely shaped orbitals. These strangely shaped orbitals are the probability densities where an electron with a particular energy level could be. And this picture depicts some of the strange shapes of these orbitals. Now this page in your notes pages talks about some of the different kinds of orbitals and their shapes. Knowing about these orbitals, S, P, D, and F, is important for understanding how electrons fill their shells as we move from element to element in the periodic table. Now let's look at the different parts of this model a little more closely. We start out with an energy level or shell. And each of these energy levels or shells has one to four subshells depending on where you are. Each subshell has one to seven of these strangely shaped orbitals. And the orbitals are different shapes and oriented differently in space depending on which orbital you're talking about. For example, the three p orbitals are all the same dumbbell shape. They're oriented in different directions, and this is what we mean by orientation. Each orbital can have a maximum of two electrons in it, even if the orbitals have multiple lobes. Also, remember that the atom doesn't really look like this. This is just a way we think about the different places that electrons can go. Now let's talk about quantum numbers. You won't be tested on these, but you should know that they exist. They're also very helpful for understanding how electrons are sorted into their various shells and subshells and orbitals in an atom. When we talk about quantum numbers, we can use the analogy of an address. So your school has a certain address, and so does each electron. And an electron's address is defined by quantum numbers. The first quantum number, we call this n, or the principal quantum number, it's like a street. It tells you what the energy level, what the shell is that the electron is in. The second quantum number, l, is like a house. 
it tells you what subshell the electron is in. Each energy level has one or more subshells. There are four different types of subshells, the S, P, D, and F, and each of these subshells contains one to seven orbitals. Now, not all shells have all of the subshells in them. For example, some have only S subshells, some have S and P's, some have S and P's and D's, etc. The third quantum number, also known as M sub L, is like a room. It tells you which orbital the electron is in. For example, which specific S or specific P or D or F. And each type of orbital has a specific shape and orientation in space. The fourth quantum number, which is sometimes called M sub S, has to do with an electron's spin. We say that a spin is up or down, and even though two electrons can be in the same orbital, each of them needs to have a different spin. It's kind of like the idea that two electrons can be in the same room, but if they are, each of them must have a different spin. So let's summarize. We talked a little bit about Coulomb's law, which illustrates the forces in the atom and how forces vary with distance and with the nature of charges. This is going to be really, really important in the next couple topics. We also talked a little bit about the shell model of the atom, also called the Bohr model, and this model is very good for describing certain types of phenomena. We talked about core electrons, which occupy the lowest energy levels, and we talked about valence electrons, which occupy the outermost energy levels and which are going to play a very, very important role when we talk about bonding. We also talked about the quantum mechanical model of the atom, which is the modern model and can explain some phenomena that the shell model just can't explain. We talked about probability densities. We also talked about the general quantum mechanical structure consisting of shells, subshells, and orbitals that are various shapes and in various orientations. We talked a little bit about quantum numbers, and quantum numbers are analogous to an address where a particular electron can be.